So Brazil is what we would call a latent nuclear state. It has the capability to enrich uranium. There was a change in the law only a year ago to open the door for uranium reprocessing in the future. The law doesn't say when Brazil will start reprocessing, but now that option is on the table. Um, Brazil enriches uranium at an industrial level, so it has a fair amount of capability to enrich. Uh, Brazil also mines uranium, and it has um, rather large uh, uranium mine fields uh, across the country. So um, in theory, Brazil has the core components to sort of dominate the field cycle. What Brazil doesn't have is uh, the technology to produce a nuclear explosive. Uh, it doesn't have the technology to deliver uh, a nuclear warhead. Um, and there is no movement in, in recent years to suggest that the country might be wanting to develop those capabilities moving forward. So when, you know, the simple answer to that question is Brazil doesn't have nuclear weapons because it doesn't need them. It doesn't have an enemy. And it lives in one part of the world where there is a regional hegemon, the United States, that provides for Brazil's security needs. So Brazil's external security environment is really, is plentiful rather than scarce. So there's no need and there hasn't been the need for uh, weaponization. That said, the really interesting question for me is, if Brazil doesn't need nuclear weapons, why invest in latency? Because when you look at the expert literature on nuclear latency, what you find is scholars agreeing that latency is a costly business. And it's costly for several reasons, partly because it takes a lot of money to put together these very vast projects, but partly because if you go down the latency path, then you risk sanctions from foreign countries, you risk enemies that will be worried that you might one day weaponize, so they might weaponize. And you know, in the extreme, you risk a preventive attack from a superior power that wants to get rid of your you know, incipient nuclear capabilities. So what's going on? And I think the interesting thing about Brazil and many other nuclear latent states that did not pursue nuclear weapons, although in theory they could have, you know, in Latin America, you could look at Argentina, you could look at Mexico, but elsewhere in the world, you could look at Sweden or Taiwan or South Korea, at some point, uh, Turkey or South Africa. We really need to try and understand what is it that latency gives countries beyond the possibility of one day building nuclear weapons. If the external security environment of a country like Brazil is plentiful, what accounts for these very costly investments when nothing suggests that one day in the near future you might need a nuclear weapon? That's what interests me about the whole nuclear latency story. So I think you could look at a range of motivating factors, right? Um, I'm gonna pick two, which to me are, are the most relevant ones. The first one, which is not well covered in the, in the literature. So one needs theory, new theory, to try and make sense of what the hell is going on, uh, is rent seeking. So in rent seeking societies, societies in which interest groups try to find permanent sources of rent that can keep cash flowing over time. Nuclear latency is really quite attractive because these are massive projects that involve many actors. You need scientists who want their own funds. You need bureaucracies. So you may have the military or you may have the National Atomic Energy Commission involved. You may have construction companies that will be in charge of putting together these massive nuclear power plants. Uh, you may have engineers within 
uh, the Air Force if you want to produce propulsion for planes. And you may have engineers in the Navy sector who may produce reactors for naval nuclear propulsion. So under certain circumstances, when the external security environment is plentiful, so there's no security motivation to develop a latent capability, but you have interest groups that are looking for opportunities to obtain secure permanent rents, then you have a big incentive to actually build up nuclear capability because these are long-term projects. Because they're normally quite secretive about technology, they are fairly sequestered from and protected from uh, Congress committees, and they tend to be quite protected from national account offices. And that's why around the globe, in countries rich and poor, developed and underdeveloped, there's so much corruption in the nuclear sector. So then the question is, are the rents that you get from this so much higher than the costs of running a latency program and risking sanctions, pressure, so on and so forth. So there's a sweet spot where you need to be in in order to make that program work for you. If your program is um, sufficiently small and you pose no threat at all to the great powers of the day, then maybe you can get away with it. If your program is vast and it draws a lot of attention, or if you're geopolitically very salient, then it's a different story. So it's one thing for a country like Brazil in Latin America, pursuing nuclear latency for rent. It's a very different story for Iran to do it. Iran would draw a lot of attention. Iran is in a very unstable neighborhood where there's a lot of countries obsessed with the possibility that Iran might break nuclear. Uh, so the costs of latency for Iran are much higher than the costs for a country like Brazil. Um, what I would say as well is that then the question becomes, um, why do publics accept this? Uh, Brazil is a competitive democracy, so elected politicians ne need to convince the public that the public needs to pay through taxation for these huge programs. And we're talking billions of dollars. Um, so the other interesting area for future study, I think, is the way elite, elites communicate and signal to the publics stories about nuclear latency. So the issue of elite cues to the public is really quite interesting. And that opens the door for the other purposes of latency. And that brings me to the second big sort of mot motivator behind um, latency. And that's to do with perceptions of inequality in the world. The fact is that nuclear technology is a huge divider between haves and have-nots. In the literature, we normally tend to focus on the divisions between those countries that own nuclear weapons and the countries that don't own nuclear weapons. But one could do the same for countries that possess nuclear technology, even if these are latent. These are not nuclear weapons technologies, but these are technologies, technologies to do with enriching uranium, reprocessing uranium, dominating the nuclear fuel cycle, and those that don't. And because since 1945, the great powers have put so much effort on restricting access to those technologies, you know, the entire architecture of global non-proliferation is all about ensuring that the nuclear club is a small one, um, that that immediately becomes a, a token for prestige, for status, and for where your country fits in the global pecking order. So if we combine the two things, you have domestic political interest groups 
that are really invested in nuclear latency programs that do not necessarily want nuclear weapons. They rather want to have the permanent rents that will come from large enrichment and reprocessing projects. Combined with a leadership that can manipulate public opinion to say, tell you what, this is great investment because it signals our special status in world politics. So, you know, within political science and international relations, there's a range of approaches you can use, right? So in the study of latency, a lot of people use statistics and they try to use statistics to isolate different explanations. I find that approach really quite limited simply because the number of countries that possess nuclear technology is so small. Trying to derive anything from statistics that stand on its own feet is, is, is rather difficult. So I'm afraid we are stuck with in-depth historical uh, source-based case studies. And that's highly problematic because case studies are great for many things. But one of the things case studies struggle with is isolating causal factors and ensuring that you are not getting your causal factors mixed up. So the challenges are, are enormous, but the fact is that we don't have much more um, than that, I'm afraid. So the first thing then is, you know, historical archives and interviews. Uh, the nuclear era is relatively recent in world historical time. So we're talking about post-1945 and for many countries around the globe, outside the United States, we're really talking about the 50s and 60s. The interesting thing about that is that many of the people who at the time were very young are still alive and they're willing to talk. Um, so interviews and historical archives are a great source. The other thing is more and more people are focusing on public opinion and elite opinion. Um, on nuclear subjects. So if you wanted to understand what sort of different framings elites can put together to try and sell the idea of nuclear latency to an uninformed general public, you know, survey experiments are wonderful for that. And then you can do it with a, a number of observations that is large enough that statistics actually work in your favor. And you can do all sorts of, apply all sorts of statistical techniques to try and make sense uh, of what's going on. The other thing that one can do is apply uh, network analysis. One of the wonderful things about studying uh, nuclear power uh, and nuclear politics in general is that contrary to what we normally think, which is nuclear global order divided by country, this is a transnational story. The construction of a centrifuge to enrich uranium is not something um, one country's done on its own ever. Uh, from the Manhattan Project, which involved scientists from Europe and it involved uranium from Latin America and from Africa, uh, to centrifuge design in Brazil today or in Japan, these are, you have, behind the story, you have these vast networks. It's sort of a, a global political economy of nuclear technology that interconnects scientists, industrialists, banks, which roll and finance these projects, so on and so forth. And as more and more countries open up their archives, one of the things you can do is transform these materials into a database, and then look at patterns of networked nuclear activity. So that would be another way of, of approaching the issue. So in, in the field of nuclear politics, there's this sort of set of criteria you need to meet if you want to attribute 
weaponization intent to a country. So you will look at whether the design for centrifuges and the amount of money that was put in there aimed at producing fissile material at a level that is sufficient for nuclear fission. So that's one thing. The other thing is you want to look at the size of stockpiles. If a country produces either um, publicly or undercover uh, vast amounts of fissile material, then you begin to suspect that this country doesn't really need all that material for anything other than, um, than weaponization. Um, if you find out that a country is working on technologies to launch uh, nuclear warheads uh, on rockets, and then it's working on the guidance system for the rockets. So these are not rockets that they plan to send into outer space to play satellites uh, there to provide internet access to their people, but rather it's a rocket designed to hit a target um, on planet Earth then you begin to suspect, well, maybe there's a weaponization intent. In the case of Brazil, um, the evidence that Brazil explored the possibility of one day building nuclear weapons concentrates around the 1960s. And these are mainly CIA reports and US embassy reports telling the story of how Brazil in the 60s began to invest big time in latent capabilities and perhaps consider the possibility of one day um, producing a nuclear explosive. Then if you look at the Brazilian archives, uh, in the 60s as well, you get, you find lots of debates within the administration um, asking the question, should we go down this path or should we not? And what would the costs be of going down this path? My favorite document is a meeting of the National Security Council in which the president of Brazil at the time says, well, this is a new technology. The most advanced countries in the world will pursue it, so we need to pursue it. The problem is, if we blow up a nuclear weapon, uh, the costs are going to be enormous and we, the world will turn against us. So we will produce an explosive. We will not call it a bomb though. We will call it a device that explodes. So that's 1967, uh, but that never came to pass because as you find in countries across the board, whenever you have a domestic coalition that wants to pursue nuclear weapons, you immediately produce a counter coalition that does not want to pursue the bomb for various reasons, either for strategic calculus, they believe the costs are gonna be larger than the benefits, or following a logic of appropriateness because they think it's the wrong thing to do to pursue nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in Brazil. And the folk that wanted to go down the proliferation path never really gained political traction, never really won the upper hand. Um, so all of that is in archives in Brazil or in the United States. But then the other interesting thing you can do is try and find what's the country that's most rival to Brazil and were they thinking that Brazil might become a nuclear weapons state? That country is Argentina. Argentina at the time also had uh, plans for nuclear latency. It also had a pro-bomb coalition, and it also had an anti-bomb coalition. Uh, and Argentina too, at the time, invested lots of money in setting up a, an incipient nuclear industry. And the interesting thing is when you go to the Argentine archives and the theoretical expectation you go in with is these guys must be obsessed and really worried that Brazilians are developing nuclear capabilities because if Brazil were to come up with a bomb, then balance of power in South America would change forever, benefiting Brazil at the expense of Argentina. But when you open the archives, what you find is this bizarre thing, which is the Argentines saying, well, yes, the Brazilians are trying to develop all this. We should do the same. 
and we should do it in coordination with Brazil because we don't think Brazil wants a bomb. We think Brazil wants nuclear latency for rent-seeking purposes and for prestige purposes, and so do we. And in fact, Argentina's biggest threat is not Brazil, is the global non-proliferation regime. It's Washington and Moscow at the time of uh, the Cold War coming together, colluding to produce this non-proliferation treaty, which really cuts off countries from that path. You know, it's uniting against all sorts of non-proliferation rules, norms, regulations, you know, the IAEA, the International Atomic Agency, sending inspectors to um, probe at your nuclear facilities. It's that kind of thing that worries you most. So you end up having this interesting, strange development in Latin America, which is that the two most developed nuclear latent states, Brazil and Argentina, rather than being at each other's throats, the minute they begin to enrich uranium, they unite and they put together a coalition to try and resist international pressure on them to relinquish the technology or to open up the technology to inspectors. And then what happens is over 20 years, they slowly join the global non-proliferation regime in their own terms, preserving their enrichment capabilities on both sides. Um, starting in the, in the 1950s, the United States launched this massive program to provide nuclear technological assistance for civilian purposes, for peaceful purposes to countries around the world, the Atoms for Peace uh, program. And at the time, Brazil uh, wanted to be a recipient and became a major recipient of that, of that funding. Interestingly though, uh, the bulk of that money didn't go into setting up a nuclear program. It went into setting up uh, the mathematics departments in Brazilian universities, engineering departments in Brazilian universities, um, bringing Oppenheimer to the tropics to give lectures and illuminate students. Um, and from the 1960s onwards, as nuclear technology begins to spread in Europe, you begin to have a market of countries that want to export and sell their technology services to large developing countries in what we now call the global south, the third world, as they called it at the time. So you had Germany, France, Canada, the United States, uh, Great Britain, the Soviet Union competing against each other to sell technology services to large developing countries that wanted to put together nuclear power reactors. And at the time, there weren't many strict rules governing what could and what could not be exported. So in that context, Brazil started to shop around. Brazil wanted to buy uh, uranium enrichment technology because it had just found all these uranium, natural uranium mines um, in its own territory. The one country that was willing to sell Brazil the full package was uh, West Germany at the time. And Brazil and West Germany negotiate this deal. And as they are negotiating this deal, the government of India runs its first ever nuclear explosion test in 1974. India, like Brazil, had also been shopping around. And like Brazil, it had found countries willing to sell it technology. But India had, undercover, without the knowledge of the nuclear providers, it had stockpiled fissile material for the first bomb. So starting in 1974, the game changes because now the world 
is in panic that there will be a second India. And at the time, there was a lot of concern over Pakistan for obvious reasons. And the other big concern was Brazil, because Brazil had just negotiated this massive agreement with West Germany. As a result of that story, the West Germans pull back and they say, we will sell you the uh, nuclear powerhouse so you can produce electricity, but we're no longer selling you enrichment technology. From that moment onwards, Brazil knows that no one will sell enrichment technology. So what Brazil does is it sets up its own program to try and develop its own centrifuge. But trying to come up with a centrifuge design is no easy task. And it's at that time that Brazil begins to try and attract scientists from around the globe and designs, and it needs to purchase uh, enriched uranium to, do the, the, to run the trial tests. So it purchases enriched uranium for various countries. And at the time you have an illicit network of scientists who are willing to sell um, these technologies to the higher bidders. Brazil fails in that attempt. So the networks in the end are not the source of technology to Brazil. The Brazilians develop their own centrifuge design, uh, but it takes a long, long time. And for the first 30 years after uh, the design is, 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 is done, uh, Brazil only enriches uranium in a lab. In other words, it doesn't have the capability to reach at an industrial level, which it only develops in the early 2000s. Um, so is it worth talking a little bit about uh, some, of, some of these um, black market deals and the importation of design and parts into, into the parallel program, thinking the, the Urenco um, designs for, for centrifuges and the parts smuggled in from France. Is, is, is it worth talking about that or? So I'll tell you what, when I, was, when I first looked at these things, I was really fascinated because I knew from the Pakistani program uh, and from the India program that in the 1970s, you had these uh, covert networks of illicit knowledge trade, basically, uh, whereby you had former employees of um, nuclear industries in Europe uh, going around the globe selling these technologies to developing countries undercover. Um, and at the time, I made a fair amount of effort in trying to uncover that side of the story for Brazil. And the more I uncover, the more I realized that Brazil never really got around to acquiring these technologies from, from these networks. You know, there is, I have a couple of people on the record actually, interviews, people saying, well, no, Brazil did purchase the blueprints from the network. And then you say, okay, and, and how do we know? And you know, the more you probe, the people tell, well, that's the story I heard. Could it be true? It could, but it, unless we have documentary evidence, um, it's very hard to, to then assume that that was, that was the case. I couldn't find, and I did look for it, I couldn't find any convincing systematic evidence that designs and materials came from these networks. What we do know is after Brazil built its centrifuges, when it was running the trial tests, we do know Brazil purchased enriched uranium from China. That's well documented in the diplomatic archives. Uh, and that's an interesting story, but that was not an illicit network because at the time there were no rules governing that kind of trade. It'd be very difficult to engage in that kind of trade today, but it wasn't at the time. So in the last 
five years or so, scholars have made a lot of progress in trying to understand how global nuclear diplomacy operates. So there's a group of people who've uh, really captured the degree to which global nuclear order is about uh, producing hierarchy in international relations. It's collusion between great powers and their allies trying to produce a club um, and make that club very exclusive and thereby uh, limiting the threat of generalized proliferation, right? So that's one side of the story. Then another group of scholars um, have pointed out that, well, yes, there's all of that going on, hierarchies, but there's also political economy. Uh, the global nuclear sector is one involving lots of money and being a part, being a member of the club or not determines how far you can get in making money for your country and for your companies out of nuclear technology. So there is a logic, which is the logic of an oligopoly, a few players that control a market, a highly regulated market. And the reason why the market is highly regulated is because the few players that have a privileged position in that market want to ensure that there is no market competition, that there, is, there are restrictions in place that will ensure a hierarchical ordering alongside economic lines, right? So those two are, to me, the most innovative recent developments in the field. So the question about what do nuclear latent states do in terms of diplomacy needs to be answered within that framework, right? Um, it's coalitions of the weak trying to mitigate the hierarchical nature of of that order. So that's one answer. There's another answer. There's a different group of scholars who worry about diplomatic communication, who worry about diplomatic signaling in contexts of, in a nuclear world, if you want. And um, these guys are looking at the role of interpersonal trust between leaders of countries that might suspect the nuclear intentions of one another. So basically what this literature says is that when you have two countries that are developing nuclear technologies and they might go down the path of a security dilemma, when one of them will acquire nuclear technology defensively or for purposes to do with rent seeking or to do with prestige, but the other one will interpret that as a potentially aggressive move. So the second one will do the same. Um, and then you get an escalatory dynamic. Uh, when those situations apply, then there's a massive role for interpersonal trust in diplomatic communications, which has been well recorded now in, in the existing uh, uh, literature. Um, the latest example of this is the United States and Iran uh, negotiating uh, the, the agreement that Obama signed with the Iranian leadership um, in, in, in the second term of the administration. Uh, it's very hard to explain if you don't understand the degree to which uh, John Kerry, then Secretary of State and his Iranian counterpart, developed um, the power of that interpersonal connection and the way that interpersonal co connection percolated and ended up bringing two sides that had everything not to agree, not to come sit at the same table. Um, that's, that's one of the, I think that's one of the most innovative recent, recent developments in the field. Of course, this goes all the way back. Reagan and Gorbachev are your classic duo, right? Um, turning the nature of an interpersonal relationship into a driver for diplomatic-led 
nuclear cooperation.